I'd like to now turn to the, the um, first panel uh, of the day, which is going to be talking about a topic that uh, Rob Bertram mentioned, which is the, the topic of nutrition. As, as Rob pointed out, getting nutrition right is essential to getting uh, food security right. Um, I, I heard someone say recently that if you want to start an argument, ask a, a, a food security expert whether nutrition is part of food security and, and, uh, and then do the same with a, a nutritionist in the room. Um, and so ask them if food security is part, part of nutrition or nutrition is part of food security. And then buy yourself a bucket of popcorn and watch the fight. Um, we try to move beyond those kinds of sterile debates and focus on practical action in Feed the Future. And so what you're going to hear in, in this morning's panel are, are some examples of practical action to integrate nutrition fully into the work of Feed the Future. Um, as many of you know, uh, Feed the Future has two overarching objectives. Uh, one is to promote inclusive agriculture sector-led growth, which we measure by targeting a reduction in poverty, and that reduction in poverty is meant to be a reduction of 20% uh, over five years in the areas in which we work. And we figure that takes us a long way towards addressing hunger in those, in those areas in which we work, because if people have money, they'll buy food, but they won't always buy the right food. And so we, we knew from early on that we had to address nutrition as well. And, uh, and that's why Feed the Future set as its other second overarching objective, improve nutrition, especially for uh, um, pregnant women and their children in the early childhood period, uh, a period that came to be recognized as the thousand days period. And this was uh, thanks to uh, uh, advice from the medical profession in particular, uh, and, and more broadly, the, 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 the world of science, that demonstrated that interventions in nutrition uh, in that that thousand days window from pregnancy through age two um, had the greatest imp impact in, in averting lifelong deficits in physical stature and strength and, uh, and, and cognitive capabilities. And that's why, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, we, we worked with the Irish government to launch the thousand days partnership to spotlight that critical window for intervention. And we uh, um, worked more broadly with the United Nations system um, on the scaling up nutrition movement internationally. So we're, you're going to hear uh, 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 more on this topic from the panel, and so I'm not going to say much more except to introduce the, the panel moderator, who is Anne Penniston. Anne is the head of, of USAID's Bureau for Health's Nutrition Division. She's had a distinguished career in public health including serving as the uh, family planning officer in Nepal, and she's also served, so she's lived the high life in Nepal, and she's also served in Peru and Indonesia and elsewhere around the world. And so I'm going to let Anne introduce the, the rest of the panel, but I just want to say that Anne really has uh, demonstrated distinguished leadership in developing uh, Feed, uh, Feed the Future's work on nutrition, USAID's work on nutrition, and now work that's going on across the U.S. government on nutrition. And so with that, let me invite Anne and the panel up to the stage. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Jonathan. It was indeed the high life in Nepal, and I see some former colleagues from Indonesia and Nepal here. But first of all, I'm really excited to be here to talk about my favorite topic, nutrition, and uh, really delighted because this is such an exciting time for nutrition globally and for USAID. And how, as you're going to hear about in a few minutes from Richard Green, we're just about to launch our multi-sectoral nutrition strategy this week. Um, and with this strategy, we are really elevating nutrition across all of our programs, and our efforts are joining those of other stakeholders around the world 
to really try and achieve greater nutrition impact globally. It's a privilege to be moderating this panel with some of my most favorite individuals whom I greatly admire. Each of them will be talking about how we can strengthen the agriculture and nutrition connection. So without further ado, let me first of all introduce Dr. Marie Ruel. She is director of IFPRI's Poverty, Health, and Nutrition Division since 2004. And since from 1996 until her current appointment, she served as a senior research fellow and research uh, fellow in that division. She's worked for more than 25 years on policies and programs to alleviate poverty, food insecurity, and malnutrition in developing countries. And most recently, she was one of the primary authors on the Lancet series, Maternal and Child Nutrition, which was published in June of 2013. She will speak about the burden of undernutrition and the role of evidence-based programming for about 20 minutes, after which there will be five minutes of questions and answers. Dr. Ruel. Good morning. <laughs> oh, I miss the equipment. <laughs> yes, thank you. I uh, just need to familiarize myself with the equipment. No, not there. Okay. Um, so I've been asked to talk about uh, the Lancet series. As uh, Anne was saying, that was published last year. Um, this is a series on maternal and child nutrition. Uh, I've put this slide up because it has the website where you can find all of the slides that, that I'm presenting and more, as well as the papers and, and a lot of other information. I'm not sure where am I supposed to point. Okay, <laughs> I don't get much instruction. Um, so uh, the the series is a series of four papers, uh, which was skillfully led by Dr. Robert Black from Johns Hopkins University. You can see here the list of uh, the main authors. Uh, we called ourselves the Maternal and Child Nutrition Study Group members. Um, so the bottom line of the series, I start with, with the, the punchline, is that um, nutrition is considered still a massive unfinished agenda. With 165,000 million sorry, children that are still stunted, and with maternal and child undernutrition being responsible or at least associated with 45% of all under five children's deaths, which is 3.1 million, we really have not achieved our goal, and we have a long way to go. Um, but we have a momentum. The, the series also recognizes that there's a lot that has been done even since the last, the previous series. There was a first series in 2008, and this certainly helped raise the issue of nutrition on the agenda. We have achieved a lot more political commitment than we've ever achieved before. So we're on the right track, but we have yet to see the impacts of all of this work. Okay, so um, the, uh, the stunting rates here, this is a, a picture that uh, shows the, on the left side, the global magnitude of the problem in, in the world of stunting. Uh, so the bars are the um, numbers of, of children and, and the blue dots are the prevalences. And it starts in 1990 and it goes to 2025. So you can see that globally uh, we have made quite a bit of progress since, to, since 1990. And, and there's, um, the curve is actually a, a prediction until 2025. So we can see that we have made progress. There's been a, a consistent reduction in stunting, 2.1% a year. Uh, but this is not enough. As I said, we still have 165 million. I just don't know how to operate this so that it is smooth. Can someone, can someone tell me where I'm supposed to? It comes or it doesn't come. Where should I direct the thing? I, OK, well, <laughs> try to be firmer. Um, so we have 26% of children are stunted now, 
Um, and the right-hand si right side slide is the statistics for Asia. On the left-hand side is Africa, and, and the bottom uh, right is Latin America. We can see that the major part of the burden is still in, in Asia, especially in South Asia and East Asia, as well as in Africa. In South Asia or Asia as a whole, however, we can see that there's been a very nice reduction since, uh, to, since 1990. Uh, but if you look at the, at the left bottom in Africa, we actually have an increase in the number of children that are stunted over time and a very uh, stagnant uh, situation where there's hardly any reduction in, in the prevalence. I know it's a, it's a region of emphasis and there is a reason why donors emphasize this region. We are not doing so well there. Uh, and Asia is doing better. It's, it, it shows increases, but it started with such high levels that we still have a long way to go as well. Well, I will need more than 20 minutes um, if it takes so long just to change the slide. I do press firmly. <laughs> okay. Um, so the prevalence of wasting, which is weight for height, low weight for height, is also uh, highly prevalent. Um, the problem with wasting and severe wasting, which is the, the dark blue uh, line, actually you don't see the, the pale blue line, which is much higher. Uh, so this is wasting and the darker one is severe wasting. Um, we still have, uh, again, a high burden of wasting both in, in, in Africa and Asia. And wasting is a very serious problem because it is associated with excessive mortality. So stunting is chronic malnutrition. Children can live like that. Children can, can have a whole life uh, grow into adults. They're not as healthy as they would be if they were not stunted, but they usually um, survive. But children that are wasted very often are not uh, able to survive. And so this is something that we really need to uh, eliminate as soon as possible. Um, so in terms of micronutrient deficiencies, those are the deficiencies of essential uh, micronutrients, minerals, and, and, um, and vitamins. Um, our, our biggest problems are still vitamin A, iron, zinc, and iodine. Uh, we have made a lot of progress in improving vitamin A. With vitamin A supplementation is one of the nutrition interventions that has been successful. Uh, but we're lagging behind in terms of improving iron, uh, zinc status, and, and these deficiencies have tremendous impacts both on physical growth but also on cognitive development. And of course, we all know that cognitive development is extremely important for the future of an individual. Um, here is the conceptual framework that we use in the series, and I'll spend a tiny bit of time on it just so that we're on the same wavelength about uh, what we understand as the determinants of child malnutrition or, or good nutrition. The, I don't have a pointer, but the pink top line is optimal fetal and child nutrition and development. This is our goal. We want healthy children that have a good uh, mental, cognitive, and motor development and that are healthy. Um, the, the top blue part of the conceptual framework is what happens if they are healthy. So we decided to put it in a positive term. This is a similar framework, but a little expanded of the UNICEF framework that you might have heard about, about the determinants of, of malnutrition. So we put it on the positive side. If you do have optimal growth, um, you have reductions in mortality and morbidity. Children tend to be less sick, die less. Uh, they are, their cognition and, and motor development are enhanced, so they're performing better in school. They, are, they tend to stay longer in school. They get more educated. As adults, they are, uh, they have taller, they are taller if, or, or they're more likely to reach their genetic potential. And they are less susceptible to obesity and, and non-communicable diseases if they're not stunted. So we know that malnutrition in early childhood is affecting the susceptibility of, of adults to become obese and, and have associated uh, risks of, of uh, chronic diseases like diabetes and, and um, 
uh, heart attacks, etc. And all of that, of course, improves work capacity and productivity and is extremely important for a nation. We need healthy, uh, well-nourished and, and, and people that have achieved their, their development potential. Uh, now, under the purple top line, we have some of the determinants of malnutrition. I, I suspect you cannot read, but um, the um, original model from UNICEF was emphasizing food, health, and care. So you don't need just food to grow and to be healthy. You need food, you need good health care, appropriate child feeding practices and, and nurturing of the parents, and you also need to be healthy. You need to have all, received all the immunization, uh, be free of infections, etc. So those are, this is the blue uh, row. And on the left side, you have the list of nutrition-specific programs and interventions that directly address those, um, those determinants of malnutrition. So you have all the inputs we need to make a child more uh, healthy, uh, and this includes uh, addressing, um, I don't think I have 45 minutes, that would be nice, but... Okay, so um, I will have to go a little faster. I just want to make sure that we get the basics uh, well understood, but the left side then tells us that we need to improve, what are the types of nutrition-specific interventions that will deliver on improving child nutrition, improving the diet of children, the care of children, and improving the health. So those are all inputs in the health sector and in the nutrition sector, and they target mothers during pregnancy and the child during the first two years. On the green, the green area below is what we refer to as nutrition sensitive development uh, or nutrition sensitive factor. The factors that are the underlying determinants of malnutrition. So this is where we have the, the economic aspects, the fact that children grow in, in environments that, where they don't have access to health and sanitation services, the fact that the household is food insecure, they don't, they don't have enough income to purchase the food that they want. And on the right side, we have all the list of uh, examples of nutrition-sensitive programs and, and approaches, and this is where agriculture is. All that long story to say agriculture is in the green, um, it is part of, the, of the, the approach to improve nutrition, but it is part of the nutrition-sensitive approach, not the nutrition-specific. And the purple part is the enabling environment, the whole policy environment in which uh, children grow and develop. So those are nutrition-specific interventions. I just wanted to mention them. Uh, they're summarized like this in terms of, of optimal maternal nutrition, uh, as I mentioned, child and, and infant and young child feeding, making sure children get all the micronutrients that they need, and the, the management of acute malnutrition is, is also very important um, in terms of, of nutrition-specific intervention. Here, uh, what the series did was to look at the 34 countries that had the highest burden of malnutrition and, uh, and that account actually for 90% of the total world burden. So those are the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, in, in South Asia and East Asia that you can see there. And then they modeled um, how can you, uh, how, how far do you go if you were to scale up all those 10 nutrition specific interventions that, that I just mentioned before, if you scale that up to a 90% coverage in these countries, how much do you reduce malnutrition and mortality in young children? I will skip this slide. We reduce um, mortality by 15% if you scale them up. And remember, we scale them up in these countries to 90% coverage. It's very high to reach that coverage. And we, we, reduce, malnutrition, we, we reduce mortality by 15%. And we reduce stunting overall by 20%. And we reduce wasting by 60%. This is, s wasting is good, stunting is not enough, and mortality is not enough. Um, so what does that mean? It means that we need to do more than scaling up nutrition-specific interventions. We need to focus on those underlying determinants, on improving nutrition through nutrition-sensitive interventions and programs as well. So um, the series um, actually had to define what we mean by nutrition-sensitive development and nutrition-sensitive programs. 
And so we mean interventions and programs that address the underlying determinants of malnutrition, as I mentioned before, food insecurity, lack of income, lack of access to health services, but also incorporate nutrition goals and nutrition actions. It has not always been like that, agriculture or, and, and social protection. And those examples at the bottom are examples of the types of programming or development programs that can be made nutrition sensitive. But in the past, they have not necessarily been nutrition sensitive. It's not because they address the underlying determinants of nutrition that they're by definition nutrition sensitive. They also have to have specific nutrition uh, goals and interventions. So in the, in the paper we reviewed, uh, a series, all of the, the, the red uh, highlights in, in terms of the types of programs that could be made nutrition sensitive, and agriculture is one, and I'll talk a little bit about it. So how do these programs improve nutrition? One of the pathways uh, is through income. So what this slide shows is, um, is how much reduction in stunting you get by improving GDP in a country. So. Over time, if you look at changes in GDP, uh, you reduce stunting by 6%. And that's the, the, the area of the, the purple curve. Um, and you can see that some countries are above, which means they have much higher stunting levels than they should given their GDP. And others are, are positive outliers, meaning they're doing really well. And you have countries like Brazil and, and uh, Costa Rica, uh, Colombia is there, Dominican Republic are doing really well. They have lower stunting than expected given their economic development, whereas you have the Guatemala and the uh, India and Bangladesh that are doing not so well. There is a r wide range of, of performance, but this gives you an idea that if we wait for income alone to reduce stunting, it's not going to be fast enough and large enough. The other aspect, very quickly, that we need to remember is that increasing income, unfortunately, is also related to increases in overweight and obesity. So not only is income not enough to reduce stunting, but it also can lead to unintended negative consequences at a faster rate. Notice here that the coefficient is 7%, so it goes even faster. So it's easier to make people overweight and obese than to reduce stunting. Um, the other aspect that I think you've discussed yesterday, we might hear more about it today, is the importance of women's empowerment. Women's empowerment is extremely important for child well-being, for uh, their households. There are positive associations between empowering women and having children that are better taken care of and better nourished. So we need not to forget to empower women. And I know it's a big focus of, of uh, see the future. Um, just very quickly, the, what, when we reviewed the, uh, what we refer to as targeted agriculture programs, we didn't review in this paper everything you want to know about agriculture and how agriculture affects nutrition. We reviewed the programs that are more development programs that have been made nutrition sensitive in one way or another or that um, had some nutrition consideration. And what we find is that um, the, uh, the targeted programs uh, in agriculture have been successful in improving livelihoods and in improving income and in reducing food insecurity. Some of them, if they're targeted to women and have, uh, in our gender sensitive, have also had impacts on, on women's empowerment. However, um, well, not however yet, they, these programs are also very important to complement the large investments in agriculture that are aimed at um, stimulating agricultural productivity. We talk a lot about feeding the planet and making sure that we have enough food, enough calories, but we need to do more than that. We need to make sure that people have access to that food and that people have access to food that is of the right quality and, and nutrient content. So in order to do that, we need some of those targeted agriculture programs that are a little bit more targeted to the poorest of the poor and that complement the other large investments in agriculture. Um, the evidence of impact on nutrition, unfortunately, is inconclusive. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that in the past, the programs were not necessarily designed as nutrition sensitive. They might have had a nutrition goal here, they might not. Uh, so we reviewed existing programs that had looked at nutrition as an outcome, but some of them were not designed to have so much impact on nutrition. 
there were weaknesses in design, there were some weaknesses in implementation, but more than anything, the biggest weakness was on the evaluation side. So you would look at a program, look promising, looks like a program that should have an impact, but then the design of the evaluation was, was not telling you anything because it wasn't rigorous, you couldn't quite believe the results or, uh, or the, the results of positive or negative. So we're not saying that there is evidence of no impact of agricultural nutrition. We're saying there is no evidence yet of impact because most of the studies have not been done properly and there's not that many studies. And I know Feed the Future and a lot of others are trying to correct that. We are working on generating evidence, evidence of the impact of agricultural nutrition. Many of us are, and we'll get there, but at the, at the time when we did the review, uh, we didn't have those and it, it was a little bit um, uh, sad. I'm skipping slides because others will talk about how to make agriculture more nutrition sensitive. Heather will talk about that. So the, and I skipped the, the slide on social protection also just uh, for lack of time. So the conclusion of, of the paper on nutrition sensitive programs is that nutrition sensitive programs have enormous potential, yet this potential is to be unleashed. Uh, we, we can see how they should improve nutrition through all the multiple pathways, which I also think uh, Heather will, will talk about. But, but why don't they? Um, so we need to do more to, to make them more nutrition sensitive. And they have the potential to help us exploit the synergies be between the nutrition specific interventions and the nutrition sensitive programs. So by addressing both the underlying determinants and the direct determinants, we expect much faster reductions in, in, in malnutrition. Um, they can play a large role also uh, in mitigating the impacts of, of shocks, global changes, crises. They can improve livelihoods, as I mentioned. They are very important in their own right for a lot of outcomes. We just need to make them a little more nutrition sensitive. And we have shown with, with, the, um, with the exercise of scaling up the, or, or the um, prediction of what happens if you scale up the nutrition specific interventions, we have shown that we absolutely need to focus more on the nutrition sensitive interventions if we want to have a greater impact on nutrition over the long term. Uh, the final conclusion of the series, uh, nutrition is foundational to development. Uh, the series certainly shows, demonstrate that nutrition is a fundamental driver of a wide range of development goals. Um, countries will not be able to achieve uh, to, to break out of poverty if they don't improve nutrition. This is very important to understand that, as, as was mentioned before, nutrition is, is not just a human rights issue, it's not just a, a, a wanting, wanting children not to die and, and, and to live better, but it's also important for development. It's a, it's a major fuel for uh, economic development. Um, under nutrition, the last bullet there reduces a nation's economic advancement by at least 8% in terms of direct productivity losses, losses via poor cognition and losses via reduced schooling. And um, the, the post, uh, we, we did want to have a statement about the post-2015 development agenda and we recommend that uh, this, this agenda prioritizes addressing all forms of malnutrition at the top of its goals. And uh, final, final, we need to uh, do this together. There is a, a big emphasis on working across sectors and, uh, and working together with different partners if we are to achieve the moment, to continue with the momentum we currently have and achieve results. Thank you. Everybody. In the interest of time, I think we'll only take one question at the moment, and then we're going to have a second Q&A after, so you'll have another opportunity. Um, does anybody have one quick question for the moment? How about you there in blue? Hello, I'm Mark Pisaki. I'm at USAID Guatemala. And uh, I want to thank you for the presentation. It's been very interesting. Guatemala is kind of, uh, kind of a unique place in that we have very high incomes compared to uh, very high rates of stunting in, in the population. And thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for pointing out that income 
alone doesn't bring down nutritional stunting rates. So, uh, I mean, I just, it's not a question really, but uh, we're looking very hard to find interventions that work in agriculture to help reduce those. And uh, I must say, it's, it's, it's been a very difficult challenge to, to find meaningful uh, projects. I think one that we looked at was animal-based uh, products that are consumed in the household to increase the level of protein, in, especially for uh, the under fives and the lactating pregnant women. And maybe you have some views on that as well. Yeah, and uh, Guatemala is uh, one of my favorite outliers. Uh, I've worked and lived there for six years and I have been very depressed by the stunting situation in that country. I always looked very tall in that country and it's never happened to me anywhere else in the world. It's, it's unbelievable, the level of stunting, and it's clearly intergenerational, uh, meaning small mothers have small babies and, and that continues and then it's very hard to break this. It's, uh, stunting is most severe among indigenous populations and there is a huge amount of inequality in that country. So unless poverty reduction efforts and, and, and all, all of the work that is done in that country aim specifically at reducing inequality, I think it will take a long time to achieve uh, major reductions in, uh, in stunting. Animal source food, just very quickly, is, is obviously a good, um, a good approach, trying to get more animal source foods in children, not just because they contain more protein, but even more importantly, because they contain much, uh, a lot of micronutrients that are much more bioavailable, easier to absorb and, and use by the body. So it's a, it's a good intervention. So we're going to move on to the panel and if there's time at the end, we'll continue with the Q&A at that point. Okay, thank you, Dr. Well. Uh, moving along, uh, Richard Green is our senior deputy assistant administrator in the U in USA's Bureau for Food Security. Um, he was a Peace Corps volunteer. I won't say the year, but it's in your folders if you really want to know. He is a Foreign Service officer, having served in Sudan, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Bangladesh, and also served in USAID Washington's Global, for Bureau Health, uh, Global Health Bureau as the director of the Office of Health, Infectious Diseases, and Nutrition. He was also mission director most recently in Bangladesh before coming back. Mr. Green. Um, I'm going to give you a very short preview of the uh, USAID uh, nutrition strategy, which is going to be formally released on Thursday. So don't quote me just yet. <clears throat> but I will say a few things. Now, let me see where. There we are. OK. Um, in my 32 year, years in development, nutrition has been a noble profession, a noble endeavor. However, a bit of a black hole, very difficult to see the light because there really hasn't been much progress. But um, now things are changing, in my view. This is a great opportunity. You just heard from Marie about some new evidence-based interventions which work. Also, you heard about the potential of a truly multi-sectoral approach to make a difference. Now, um, the, uh, we have a great opportunity not only to make some lasting progress in reducing stunting and nutrition, but it's a great opportunity to do a new nutrition strategy for USAID. Um, and this in the fourth year, the end of the fourth year of Feed the Future, end of the fourth year of Global Health Initiative, it is the right time to think about this. And there's three components of our new strategy. Number one is setting ambitious targets. Two is committing to manage in a more disciplined and rigorous integrated manner. And three, focusing on some of the high impact interventions which Marie talked about. So we have three major goals. Everywhere we work, whether it is Food for Peace, whether it's Global Health Initiative, or whether it is the Feed the Future Initiative, we're gonna to endeavor to reduce stunting by 20%. 
but in the food for peace zones and the feed the future zones of influence, we will reduce the number of stunted children by more than two million children. And in humanitarian situations, we're gonna keep something that's called global acute malnutrition, which is a combination of wasting and edema below the crisis level of 15%. So, um, nutrition is uh, something that we've been working on for 30, 40 years across the US government in a, a global situation. However, it isn't until recently that with a multi-sectoral approach, which is outlined and focused on this strategy, and with the idea that we've really got interventions at work, that we can think about our approach to nutrition in a much more disciplined manner, whereas in the past, it was just part of one of 20 different health items which we integrated into our MCH programs. So this is really something new. It's an opportunity like we had for malaria and tuberculosis on the health side to, to really set clear targets within zones of implementation, such as at what level do we want to increase exclusive breastfeeding to in order to achieve a 20% reduction in stunting. Also, we want to make sure that we support a country's nutrition strategy and we want to really integrate across Food for Peace, Feed the Future, the Ending Preventable Child and Maternal Death um, Initiative, and that means aligning our programs, and that means reaching every child using these different programs for the first time. So, as you heard from Marie, we have a series of high impact interventions that we really didn't have the evidence for in the past. Some stuff that surprised me, such as the importance of community management of acute malnutrition, or um, how uh, effective normal fortification activities, which we've had, um, uh, thank you, uh, which we've had uh, for 20 years, but really haven't brought to scale. The, um, we also reinforce the idea of the importance of maternal nutrition, which we don't have a lot of interventions for, as well as traditional things such as exclusive breastfeeding. We also, in the emergency situation, we also have some, uh, some new foods such as something called ready-to-use supplementary food and ready-to-use therapeutic foods uh, that will improve our response to humanitarian crises. Uh, in terms of sustainability, for the first time, we're really going to engage the private sector and learn from them how to reach consumers, not with non-nutritious food, but with nutrition-dense food. Uh, and so we're going to have some new types of partnerships with the private sector. We are going to train more professionals in nutrition. When I was mission director in Bangladesh, we had just a few uh, trained nutritionists in the entire Ministry of Health or Ministry of Agriculture, and this is true across Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. And we're gonna promote continued strong leadership of civil society and national governments to address stunting and continue our global leadership, especially in research such as trying to develop proof of principle for things such as nutrition sensitive agriculture. So, the USAID nutrition strategy is the first step in what will become a whole of government US nutrition coordination plan where we will improve coordination at the country level, we'll improve our, uh, we'll improve our global leadership uh, efforts, but also we will take some of the most promising nutrition interventions across the interagency and expand them, make them whole of government. For instance, CDC's excellent nutrition surveillance program at USAID, we're gonna to begin to adopt that. USAID's exclusive breastfeeding efforts, which have been successful in many countries, are gonna be taken up. PEPFAR has a very exciting 
nutrition assessment and community service program as well. So we look forward to that a little later in the year. Uh, and just let me say that as people have said, this is the time to make a difference in nutrition with tremendous global interest, new evidence, and new funding. However, if we don't take advantage of this window of opportunity, I don't think we're going to get another chance to uh, uh, sustainably reduce stunting and improve nutrition in our programs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Richard, and we'll hold questions until the end. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Jennifer Rigg. She is Director of Policy and Partnerships at the Thousand Day Partnership. Previously, she worked at Save the Children on Public Policy and Advocacy, where she led advocacy on nutrition, food security, livelihoods, foreign aid reform, early childhood development and education, while at Interaction uh, while uh, co-chair of the Interaction Food Security Working Group, she helped organize the Thousand Days launch in 2010. She also serves on the Roadmap to End Hunger Steering Group, and she will speak about the role of civil society organizations in promoting nutrition. Ms. Rigg, thank you. Thank you so very much, Anne, Jonathan, Richard, and Diane. It's really an honor to be here with Marie, Heather, and all of you. We especially applaud the creation of the USAID multi-sectoral nutrition strategy launching on Thursday. Thank you for that sneak peek. And uh, we're very excited as well about the current, currently being developed US whole of government global nutrition coordination plan. At the 1000 Days Partnership, our mission is to promote targeted action and investment to improve nutrition for mothers and young children during that critical thousand day window of opportunity from a woman's pregnancy to her child's second birthday when better nutrition can have a lifelong impact on a child's future and help break the cycle of poverty. We launched in 2010 at the same time as the Scaling Up Nutrition or SUN movement. Within the SUN movement, national leaders are prioritizing efforts to address malnutrition. The SUN movement unites people from government, civil society, international organizations, donors, businesses, and researchers in a collective effort to improve nutrition. As Dr. Shaw, who sits on the Sun Lead Group, said yesterday, our efforts only succeed when everyone works together. This past year has been especially exciting across Sun, and there are now over 50 Sun countries working together to scale up nutrition, as well as four Sun networks, civil society, UN business, and donor networks. Across the Sun Movement, I'd like to highlight just a few of the, the ways that civil society organizations or CSOs can and do support robust nutrition outcomes. First, building, accelerating, and sustaining political will. For example, the Child Nutrition Initiative, or CNI in Peru, is a coalition advocating to make nutrition the central component in the government's fight against poverty and serve as a public platform to disseminate and review government efforts in the fight against malnutrition. CNI has secured and sustained political commitment from elected officials, presidential candidates, and regional presidents, including a pledge by 10 presidential candidates to make the fight against malnutrition a national priority if elected. In 2012, national guidelines to reduce malnutrition in Peru were approved. A number of ministries and 25 regional presidents signed a national agreement for coordinated action against child malnutrition establishing a multi-annual nutrition budgetary commitment, interministerial strategy, effective interventions to reduce child malnutrition and districts that should be prioritized. CSOs often form a bridge between communities and government, providing a mechanism for communities to share their concerns and advocating for the people they serve. CSOs can also function at a national or global scale, bringing issues of wider concern into local, national, or international discourse to highlight the powerful communications and media platform that civil society partnerships can bring, let's turn to Zambia. Zambia's Sun Civil Society Alliance facilitated a training to promote better understanding of nutrition. The current affairs manager for Zambia's main television station, ZNBC, participated in the training, prompting the creation of a documentary called The Silent Story, showing the magnitude and effect of undernutrition. 
The story aired multiple times during prime viewing times this past December. Third, CSOs add value via established connections with communities, governments, and the private sector, technical expertise and capacity building, nutrition programming, and reaching the most vulnerable, and an ability to make and deliver long-term commitments to improve nutrition outcomes. Earlier, Jonathan mentioned the overall food and nutrition security pledge. Last year, at Nutrition for Growth in London, Interaction and its members pledged to spend more than $750 million, a part of that pledge, over five years, an expansion in the time horizon, in privately raised non-governmental funds to improve nutrition, including access to nutritious food, promotion of breastfeeding, and good nutritional practices, and the provision of micronutrients and therapeutic feeding. Last night at that Capitol Hill event, USAID and Interaction signed an MOU as a new way of partnering, providing a framework for USAID and NGOs to work together more effectively from program design to implementation, with potential to accelerate coordinated progress in the fight against malnutrition. The participating organizations are reporting spending annually through Interaction using the G8 L'Aquila Food Security Pledge reporting standards. CSOs can build the evidence base of what works best and take it to scale. For example, in Malawi, a new project was launched earlier this year to tackle and prevent stunting in, new, in children, while also generating new evidence on ways to reduce stunting and aiming to achieve 100% coverage of households with mothers and children in the thousand day window. The project supporters include the government of Malawi, SIF, WFP, and World Vision as the lead NGO. It's also critical as we think about the evidence that we need to build together, that we all build and strengthen a nutrition data revolution to add to the report of the high-level panel on the post-2015 development agenda. And they called specifically to improve the quality of statistics and information available to citizens and empower people with information on the progress towards targets. Now is the time to increase the frequency and enhance the quality of nutritional surveillance, nutrition surveys, and nutrition impact data. Finally, as implementers and innovators, CSOs and every one of us can focus across agriculture, humanitarian response, nutritional resilience building, economic development, food safety, WASH, gender, education, early child care and development, health, and all of our, our work on the key thousand day window when children's futures are being decided for them. With thanks to Richard and those of you who know the local context quite well, I will attempt to close with an example from Bangladesh. The Strengthening Household Ability to Respond to Development Opportunities Program, otherwise known as Shuhardo, designed and implemented by CARE with funding from USAID, empowers women to actively engage in food and nutrition security in their communities. This powerful mix that included solidarity groups, nutrition education, water and sanitation improvements, and local institutional capacity building led to remarkable results. The prevalence of stunting among children from six months to 24 months old in the Shuhardo Project's operational area declined from 56% to 40% over a 3.5 year period, a decrease of approximately 4.5 percentage points per year. During this same period, stunting was stagnant in Bangladesh as a whole and even increased for some of the time due to a major food price crisis and adverse weather conditions. I truly look forward to hearing your ideas about ways we can together improve maternal and child nutrition outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And so last but not least, uh, Heather Danton, who is Director of Food Security and Nutrition at USAID Spring Program, uh, will speak to us about pathways from ag to nutrition she has 25 years of experience in the area of food security and livelihoods and in the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of programs that inter integrate economic growth and, lively and agriculture with nutrition in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And uh, prior to joining Spring, she also worked at uh, Save the Children Federation as Senior Director for Food Security and Livelihoods. Ms. Danton. I got it straight. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so uh, I don't know what I'm standing here between you and the break, I think. Um, but uh, yesterday I heard a lot about the role of uh, Feed the Future in improving 
agricultural growth, economic growth, um, incomes for the poor, all great stuff. Um, but I didn't hear so much about, oh, I see what you mean about this. Oh, how do I go back? Hmm. Oh, back too far. Goodness. I agree with Marie about this. <laughs> anyway, you guys know what this is. This is the, your favorite Feed the Future framework. And, um, sorry, it's not a great slide. It's a little bit cloudy. But uh, the section in the green on the far left, that's what we talked a lot about yesterday. I was really um, interested that very little was mentioned about the part on the, uh, on the left, the orange part. And yet, there are two sort of pillars that lead to the overarching goal of hopefully sustainably reducing global poverty and hunger. Um, so we've been trying to talk a little bit about nutrition here today. I feel like it's been maybe kind of like parachuted down and inserted into a world of tractors and improvements in uh, uh, agricultural practices, and by the way, I am an Aggie. I have a vegetable crops background. But um, I think that Marie made it really clear that there is a really important role for agriculture, and especially for food, in um, driving towards nutritional improvements, nutritional goals, and especially for young people. There was a lot of mention yesterday about the role of, of agriculture in our Feed the Future countries reaching youth. Um, if the youth start out their first thousand days malnourished, they will not actually help us realize where we think we are going with all the great improvements we've done with agriculture. So how are we gonna get from inclusive agricultural sector growth to improve nutritional status? Our problems in Guatemala, um, I've been in Tajikas, I've been in a number of the Feed the Future countries, and the Spring Project has an opportunity to be looking at and working more closely with the Feed the Future missions to try to get answers to this. And I echo Marie's uh, point that many of us are figuring out, try, trying to figure out how to do this. We don't have answers yet, but you guys in these countries you are what is going to help us answer this problem because you are the perfect little platform for the nutritionists and the agriculturalists to come together. So um, I guess for now, there's been a lot of focus on food and food systems. What I think most of the Feed the Future projects are doing is trying to improve all the components of food systems and uh, it's going to pay off. I think you guys are already seeing payoffs from this. You're improving production, you're looking at and driving things through a market-based approach, you're improving processing, storage, somebody mentioned storage, the importance of storage at the household level all the way up, um, and all of the preparation for consumption. Guess what, people also have to eat it, and as Marie said, it has to be eating the right types of food, or else we're gonna skip right over into from from improvements in income right into you know, countries of uh, high levels of obesity. And that's not gonna help us with economic growth either. So um, we are focusing, I think, in most of our countries on people. Whoops. That was very cute. And I just wanted to point out that these systems, which are comprised of or organizations and businesses and firms that are driving food systems, all of those uh, systems components, whether it's input supply all the way up to retailing, they're all comprised of people. And those same people are the people who are our consumers, they have children. Those children, in many cases, and I think the point that Mark was pointing out earlier about the problems in Guatemala, why is it that people have money but their children are still stunted. So all of these people that are participating in your value chain work also are our participants, our beneficiaries, and in many respects, uh, our clients. So what do we do this? What do we do about this? Um, and I just wanted to point out that 
I've sort of simplified um, my thinking about Feed the Future by thinking about food systems and, and value chains leading to, to three major outcomes. Increasing food production, pretty simple. Increasing agricultural income and economic growth. And women's empowerment. We talked about the women's empowerment yesterday, by the way, nobody mentioned anything about nutrition during that. And I was kind of interested that we're talking about women being empowered in agriculture, but they also at the same time are going home, they're taking care of their children. They themselves have to stay healthy so that they can care for their children and also to continue to, to bring money into the household to then move on up. And I, I think that as women, as maternal nutrition, uh, is not often thought about, it still needs to stay in the mix here. So when we think about what we're going to do to link our agricultural work to nutritional outcomes, women and the health of women, as well as their children, needs to stay in that mix. So women's health is also inc included in, that in the women's empowerment com com component. Um, so how do we do this? How do we go from food systems to improve nutritional status, especially maternal and, and child nutrition. I took this slide from Susan Bradley. Uh, those of you who maybe attended the Agriculture and Nutrition Global Learning and Evidence Exchange, um, you've seen this slide. So um, right now I think there's a lot of this going on where we are doing great work on the ag food systems value chain side. And then somehow miraculously, you know, we're going to improve agricultural income and in increase production. And miraculously, we're going to get to improve nutritional status. Um, and I think that it's filling in that gap that many of us are working on right now in terms of both research and implementation. Um, so I'm going to put up one more framework. I'm really sorry. <laughs> but um, this is going to give you a little bit of a clue as to how you can go from the value chain at inclusive agricultural sector growth, improving food systems towards child nutritional outcomes and maternal nutritional outcomes. These pathways, as you can see, um, have the three components that I just put up there. Increased food production, increased agricultural income, and improved women's empowerment. These are the three major outcomes that we're hoping for from our agricultural work, right? I mean, in a simplified form. But in order to get to nutrition, we can't just assume that, in fact, all of these other pieces that we know need to take place for women to, uh, women, men, and children to actually have better nutrition needs to be included in our, in, in our agricultural project design. I unfortunately don't have the time to go through this. I just got my three minute warning. Um, but I did want to point out just a couple things. Uh, one is that we've talked about many of these things already. The importance of processing and food storage, lengthening the amount of time that people have food in their households. Just a, an example of something that women often do control and if the, the processing and storage component is there, that maybe that's leading to increased food access. And when we think about what we are measuring in our agricultural programming for nutrition, it's often dietary diversity. What we're storing in the household often is not terribly diverse. So we can't just look at one pathway at a time. We actually have to look at the production side leading to all of these things that extend the amount of food that's available in the household, and at the same time looking at women's empowerment, looking at women's health, looking at the health of children, and how people are spending their money. What are they investing that income in, and how do they knew, know to spend their money that way? And that's a lot of what I think we can do at Feed the Future. So just to end, um, I just wanted to point out that C uh, Spring is uh, here to help you. Uh, this is a picture taken from the uh, Asia Ag Glee. Um, and we have been 
working on a couple other things. Um, there was a landscape analysis that was done of the Feed the Future projects looking at opportunities for nutrition. Um, there's a series of technical briefs that actually outlines those pathways that I just put up. Um, so if you want to know more, please go out and pick up the packet. It has it out there. Um, and we also are working with the missions to help uh, share information and uh, findings and better practice through webinars and a number of other knowledge management approaches. So that's it for spring. I'm not going to finish my slides. <laughs> Do we have any time for questions and answers? One minute. Oh, my heavens. There's an update. We actually have a few more minutes. So, um, <laughs> thank you, Diane. <laughs> so, um, can I take the first question, please? Boy, I'm blinded by these lights. How about you, right Sorry there? I'm Mary Jenga from Kenya, and having listened to the presentations on uh, agriculture and nutrition connection. My question is, uh, how does cooking energy poverty affect, uh, contribute to malnutrition and hunger? Because um, looking at what is happening, for example, in uh, Africa, and possibly this is happening in other developing countries, is that mothers are shifting from cooking nutritious food that take a long time to cook and cost a lot of money and shifting to something else. So is um, uh, having access to affordable cooking energy in the agenda of uh, trying to uh, reduce malnutrition and uh, hunger? Let's see if we could answer that. Who, who's comfortable taking that question? Marie, are you comfortable with that one? Uh, so the question is whether or not we've considered the issue of cooking fuel um, in our um, nutrition sensitive interventions because of the time factor a woman's busy during the day doing her livelihood and then she has mm -hmm. to come home and cook. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want me to answer now? If you feel comfortable answering yeah. that. Uh, it, it's definitely a really important issue and this is why some, uh, quite a lot of countries have worked on trying to design more ready to use products. Uh, the cereals that are pre-cooked, and but then, of course, if they're pre-cooked and packaged, they're more expensive. So it's it's a little bit um, difficult to get to the, the perfect product that doesn't require some cooking, and, and it's always better if you are to add water, it's always better that the, the water be boiled for safety issues. Uh, so it's it's not an easy an easy issue, but definitely it is being considered a very important point. W women's time and, and the opportunity cost of of spending all their time on cooking rather than doing uh, engaging in income generation activities. And then we have Richard and then Heather who can also uh, add to that. I just wanted to put a plug in for the cl uh, clean cook stove initiative, which uh, I was a part of in Bangladesh which is very important because it does not only uh, prevent, uh, there's evidence it prevents uh, uh, indoor air pollution and pneumonia, but also it can save time by having affordable, uh, high quality fuel. Uh, it, it can save women's time, and this is something that, uh, that we've supported, and it, uh, it cuts across environment, climate change, agriculture, and health. Mm -hmm. And the next question, please. Um, how about you right there? Sorry, I'm having trouble seeing at the back with the lights. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Alun Fal, and I'm the Director General of the National Agriculture Research Center in Senegal, the Agriculture Institution. Uh, as a researcher, I've been working for years on food security. Now it comes in nutrition. I guess I, I'm gonna say, you guys, welcome to the large field of agriculture, because nutrition was not the main concern. We were be talking about food production. And, and the bad news is, uh, for years, we've been working on registration of new varieties. So whatever farmers are producing in the land, those varieties should be registered first. And the only indicator we have for registering varieties 
is the yield. There has to be a high yielding variety. We didn't look at the market value. We didn't look at the nutrition value. We just say this variety yields more than the other variety, so we can register the variety. And legislation is very blind in some, in, you know, in African countries because we have legislation behind all those registered varieties because only registered varieties can be produced seeds. The official process of producing seeds rely on registered variety. Meaning that I, I witnessed because I was on, in a committee, so we had a very nice rice variety which is very rich in terms of nutrition. Because the variety was yielding less than the other varieties, it has been eliminated. So no seeds are <coughs> is produced right now for that type of variety. But meaning that uh, Feed the Future and the new alliance uh, of food security and, and nutrition has a big challenge. Uh, I mean, a lot of advocacy to do in terms of when we are registering now a variety, we should look at the quality of the variety, not only the quantity side, because usually we look at the quantity side, we don't look at the quality side. And um, since yesterday, you know, there's a, a big experience happening in Senegal, and uh, I, I guess uh, we should have a presentation on that. It's the Yajende and Krusa, uh, which is working very closely on food and nutrition. I mean, uh, I guess uh, uh, they are here in this room, maybe they should have maybe expose a little bit what they are doing on the side of nutrition going along with food production. Uh, because just like I'm telling you, a uh, uh, variety which is not registered can be produced uh, by farmers. So all the what the farmers are producing right now is just the quantity means high yielding variety, not quality food. Okay, thank you very much. Heather, do you feel comfortable taking that question? It sounds like a pathways question so to uh, me. I mean, um, I'm not sure that it's so much a question as a plug to um, please go out and look at the Yajinde booth for sure and talk to those guys. They're doing a great job. Yes, yeah, Spring actually did some work with Yajinde. Um, we're very interested in the model that they've been using, and it's one that we will be tracking. There, uh, there's a, been a field note that's already been published about it, and um, the approach that is being used there is very much of a nutrition-sensitive approach to agriculture. Um, they are incorporating nutrition into the way they are not only promoting agricultural messages, but in fact they're planning ahead and thinking about sustainability, training frontline workers. Um, they've got uh, ministries of agriculture and health and nutrition coming together. It's really a, a fabulous model. Um, so in terms of the, the pathways that I was showing up there, uh, one thing that the Yajinde project has done is they have actually, without the pathways, I don't think that they use the pathways per se, but they actually have been connecting the dots as they've been thinking about, well, income to nutrition, what needs to go through there? Who needs to control that income in order to make the right purchasing decisions? And what knowledge does that person who has the money have to have in order to know what to purchase? And on top of that, should we be per, uh, uh, growing more uh, diverse foods, more nutrient-dense foods, and how do we promote that at the household level and drive the market for it? And that's really where I think Yajinde is a leader um, in trying to make that connection to markets and um, household food consumption habits. And it's not easy to do, but that's where we all kind of need to go. That'll be about it for the questions and answers in this session. I just wanted to encourage all of you to join our nutrition breakout session. Later this day, we're going to actually do the same session twice, and we'll discuss um, the nutrition strategy rollout in more detail. And also, we're going to look at uh, how to use monitoring data to improve program outcomes and to intensify our nutrition activities to achieve our highest level outcomes. And please don't go away, we're about to have a dev talk, and we'll see you later, thanks.